you see Davis, you see San Diego. And we put on the table, you know, it's like, what if we were to bring that data together and how could we think differently about the care of our patients? And so uh, we actually said yes to that strategy. We hired a, a fantastic individual, Dr. Atul Butte. We hired him away from Stanford to join us here at the University of California. Uh, and we drove out of our, our system-wide function, which we call UC Health, really a strategy for bringing together our healthcare data, our, specifically our electronic healthcare data. And you can see that, you know, in addition to having 17 million people represented in that single database, you know, hundreds of millions and even billions of data points that we could start to figure out what drugs work for what type of patients. How do we drive utilization and reduce the, the length of stay of patients in the hospital? And so it started with bringing data together our data to solve real practical problems to how we run healthcare enterprises and care for patients every day. So it was very outcome oriented. That's where we started. But what I knew from my time in industry was that was really just going to be the starting point. And what we ended up doing around that, let's call that that data asset, was then building an institute around it uh, to basically say that data, and this is how data is fundamentally different than an asset like a truck, which is either full of something and you're taking it somewhere or it's sitting empty in a parking lot. Data you can aggregate and put into use multiple ways concurrently and generate value streams in a, in a concurrent way, right? In, in, in healthcare, I usually say, you know, a hospital bed either has a patient in it and generating revenue or it's sitting empty and it's cost. Data can work very differently and that's part of the mentality that we've been trying to drive through the way that we think about solving complex problems. And so that database then ultimately became a center, the Center for Data-Driven Insights and Innovation, and now serves many, many purposes around the university. We're still using it to drive better clinical outcomes for our patients. We're using it to bend the curve on the way it costs. So for example, think of type two diabetes. Type two diabetes is not one disease. There are at least six different types of diseases. There are a myriad of different types of drugs that could be used, some at a thousand to one cost difference and trying to match the right patient to the right option the first time is something that we're doing through data. And you'd be amazed at how often you don't get it right the first time with a type 2 diabetes patient. So the, so the data became an asset that now drives our research enterprise, our operational metrics, our clinical outcomes. And this was a mentality. I have some blank slides in here, and this is because I want to tell stories for the benefit of the group, but I want to keep, you know, I want to keep the innocent unnamed, right? Um, what we did when we saw this, Dr. Butte and I, uh, who has his appointment at UCSF was nobody, we didn't have enough data, even as the University of California to study the really complex challenges in healthcare. And so we went on a, a quest, right, to try to attract organizations like ours, a small number around the country, to find a coalition of the willing to basically say, we need to get together, right? We need to get together and pool our data assets, our subject matter experts, and build something bigger, broader, more representative of the entire country. Because even in California, with as diverse a state as we are, there's still a lot of differences from the residents of California versus Nebraska versus Maryland versus Florida. So we knew we needed access to more data for more diversity, as well as to be able to fully use the, the, the opportunities that AI was giving us. Unfortunately, we couldn't make that come together. You know, it was a combination of the technology platforms we had available to us in that 2015 timeframe were just not as mature as we have today. The second part was we had a lot of issues because of the sensitivity of healthcare data to be able to get over compliance, regulatory, and privacy issues. We just, we felt short and, and we ultimately didn't get that coalition of the willing. So we kind of backed off and there have been some things that have started in the healthcare industry like that, but they still are very one dimensional. And what I mean by that is, really this picture, which is, you know, healthcare is a multi-dimensional, multimodal data challenge. If you think about what around any individual today, the data that you might be able to collect, the things that we're able to represent in a digital data stream way, the electronic health record is one of them. My lab values, my lipid panel, a medical image like an X-ray, you know, or a, you know, a cardiac CT, my genomic profile, Okay, you can get down to the cellular molecular level and to be able to understand people. Behavioral, the whole wearable movement is about a behavioral. This little device that sits on my finger tells me about my activity. It tells me about my sleep. It tells me that my, my uh, uh, temperature is a little bit above normal and says, are you feeling okay? It tells me what time I should go to bed. It's all about behavioral feedback and environmental understanding. You think to, to, together about, do I live in a place that gets a lot of sun? 
Do I live in a place that has good or bad air quality? Do I live close to places where I have good fresh food options? These are all environmental understandings and all this data can be integrated together. This is where I knew that the world of healthcare meets data science was going. And so if you look at the world today, this is a picture just recently published in Nature Magazine. You know, it is a very, very multi-mold problem that we want to be able to. And I think about data. I think about something that we're capturing now in a digital data stream, really good example. And this is a little far-fetched, but this whole interaction is a digital data stream. There's a camera that's catching me, right? There is a tonal, and that, you know, there's a tonal wave file that's being generated around my voice. There is transcription of the words that I use. I know of three startups, all very separate, that are taking those data streams and building predictive AI algorithms that could tell you that I might be a very depressed individual. <laughs> so this is a mental health predictive algorithm going on right in here in this room right now. That might sound a little ridiculous, but they, I can tell you, I can name three stars for you if you wanna hear about them right after we're done. They are actually doing that. And this is all part of this data movement that's coming and affecting the way we think about keeping people healthy, providing feedback around where is someone on their health journey. And so this data explosion in healthcare is really getting us to think about data isn't just part of what we do to solve problems and to create better outcomes. It is the strategy. It's the way that we have to think. We have to, just like some of the companies that have disrupted other industries, we have to think about data as the way that we disrupt ourselves in healthcare and think about new models of doing things. Right. The other part that we're taking from other industries and thinking about how healthcare is changing in the future is using ecosystem thinking. Right. It's really about how do you bring a diverse set of people together, using the data as the raw material that brings them together and allows them as different subject matter experts put into interdisciplinary environments to do things differently than what they've been able to do before. And the ecosystem grows in value and possibilities as you grow the number of ecosystem members. So you wanna make a very, very inclusive environment. And so at UCI, when I came down there, they said, you know, put us into this distinctive differentiated place with our strategies. We came up with the concept called the collaboratories at UCI. Fancy picture, but what does it mean? What it means is that we think about data as the raw material to drive impact, right? We think of the, it also as the raw material that drives better outcomes. As one of my colleagues from industry says, you know, a data-driven organization today makes better decisions, faster, more consistently, and increasingly at scale. And so if you take that mentality and you start to say, as we think about the future of healthcare, how do we think about data driving all of those metrics, right? It's about outcomes, it's about impacts, and of course, as a research university, there's also about how do we create multidisciplinary science problem-solving teams, so we need to advance you know, the excellence around our research. But at the top there, you'll see we talk about, it's not just about research excellence, it's about, you know, as a research university at UCI, with a health system, we see patients every day. And so sometimes academic medical centers will have taglines like, we don't just practice med uh, medicine, we invent it. But I'll say the opposite is also true. We don't just invent medicine, we practice it. We have to build a, you know, a cyclical loop that says, how do we take the insights that we find in our research environment, in our translation engines, and actually bring it to the patient, to the benefit of the patient, and not take 17 years to do it, right? It's also about this individual empowerment movement. How do you excite you know, patients to actually take control of their health journey through giving them more data. That's what the wearable movement's all been about. But why should it stop at the wearable movement? Research has shown that patients given the clinical notes written by the doctor actually have better adherence to staying on their medications or changing their behavior. They actually give 70, I think 72% of them saying, I like the fact that I can see what my doctor wrote about me puts more pressure on the doctor to write a note that let's say might be a little bit more sensitive in terms of the words that are used, but if it drives the right patient behavior, it's absolutely worth it. And then finally, we never do things alone in today's world. The world is too complex and we don't always have, we never have all the capabilities. So it's about who are the right strategic partners. Those partners come from all different methods and I'll show you kind of some of the things we're doing in healthcare. They are government agencies, they are industry, they are other, universities, they are regulatory bodies, 
right? Uh, they are community leaders, community organizations. They're all part of this concept of how do you build an ecosystem brought together and working together through data. And so our you know, verbal definition of a collaboratory is really about, it's a platform, but don't just think about a platform for data. It's a set of capabilities, things that allow you to do things and, and, and push the boundaries of innovation, but it's a collaborative culture. We're creating a culture around these collaboratories to saying, it's about coming together. It's about being inclusive. We don't think of it as just a data analytics platform. We think about it being an operating system, right? So an operating system on your computer has systems and processes and all those things are designed into what we do. And then ecosystem thinking is about not just enabling different actors within the ecosystem, but connecting them, thinking in a boundaryless fashion. You know, coalitions of the willing need to continue to be invested into to find more willing participants. And in today's world, especially as a public research university, it's about inclusiveness. It's about really thinking about the equity challenges we have in our society and how do we ensure that we design into them uh, the way that we're thinking about data, the way that we're using data, the way that we're developing algorithms in a way that brings closing the gaps on equity rather than growing them, uh, you know, uh, which is always a challenge with technology. Okay. Uh, so the first collaboratory that we launched was in the healthcare space. We already kind of had a, a slow moving train. And so the concept of the collaborator really put a strong engine underneath that where we came together. But what we found out of that was the collaboratory was creating this kind of environment where data was a common you know, material for people to work with, but we needed to connect in the other capabilities that we had across just our campuses as we started. And so we built an institute off of the collaboratory. And this picture represents that we set the collaboratory up to be kind of the axle of the engine that drives the speed and the power of what we can do with the entire wheel. So whether it's the educational component, right? Whether it's really focusing on equity and how we think about equity, is it's about the, the design into the algorithm development methodology to ensure that the data they're grabbing and the methods that we're using don't create biases in the model from the very, very start. We've tried to take that all the way back to the beginning. It's about the implementation engine that we call A3. And I'll show you a slide about how we think about the development of algorithms, but how we bring them to the point of impact so that the patients that we see tomorrow have benefited from the 100 patients with that disease that we saw yesterday. And so there's lots of ways of depicting, like, what do we do with data? And this picture, there's an APHIS version of it all the same, right? Because it's a lot of data coming in from different sources. How do you pull it together? How do you connect it? How do you curate it? How do you contextualize it? How do you make it available? We have all of those things in our ecosystem, but we've also thought about in that ecosystem, this is not just for UCI. How do we think about onboarding ecosystem partners in a way fast? How do we allow them to bring their data sets into our data sets in a very, very fast on-ramp? We've also thought about our implementation methodologies for, we wanna be able to implement tools back into our clinical setting for UCI patients. But we also stand with a public mission of making the world a better place. How do we take those insights and find mechanisms to push them the other way on the on-ramp back out to the people who are seeing patients in the very qualified health clinics around the country or the rural hospitals? How do they get benefit from these AI technologies that we're deploying to look into data and find new insights? The other thing that we know is that making it easy for the collaborators, whether those are someone from the School of Engineering and the School of Medicine to work together or getting someone from the pharmaceutical company to work with the people from social sciences and, and the School of Information and Computer Science. It's about creating the scaffolding around the data that allows people to ask their questions, get to the services, the capabilities, the data that they're looking for, connect the data, connect the people, and to create the right type of, of, of mechanisms to innovate and transform. We don't do it alone. We have industry partners that we work with uh, who are as bought into the vision as we are, and it's about enabling this and creating an environment where the ecosystem can continue to grow. I thought it'd be interesting because I know this is always you know, a challenge, which is, you know, um, and I come from industry for most of my career. So, you know, a lot of, you know, what you look at research is great, but at the end of the day, how does it impact the end customer user markets? Uh, in my case, I did a lot of work around the globe. So I think about not just what happens in the United States, but you know, what happens in France, what happens in China, what happens in Indonesia, what happens in Africa. And so how do you think about, and how do you depict and 
implementation cycle that allows you to say, we can find the data, we can identify the problem statement, we can identify the data we need to really investigate and find insights into that. We can bring together the different capabilities, not just analytical capabilities, but it's insights from maybe people from social sciences who understand human behavior or psychology. But the really, really thing that we really, we found during the pandemic, when we were trying to do this at rapid speed to essentially save lives and make sure that we were leveraging our assets like a hospital bed for the sickest patients, we had to be able to figure out how do we go from developing a predictive algorithm to how do we deploy it to figuring out how it works better than what we were doing, you know, we were doing yesterday, and then implement it all the way into this is the way we're going to do it going forward. Let's call it the new standard of care. So you're actually implementing the market, and tomorrow's customers are getting a better service than yesterday's customers. And that's a cycle that we had to figure out how to do, how to repeat, how to do it at increasing speed, and then how to take the scale, meaning how can we teach other organizations the way we do it. This is a work in progress, but this is an example of, it started with a COVID vulnerability score where UCI had benchmarked the second best COVID survivability of anywhere in the country. The people in Washington said, how, how did you do this? And we explained to them how we were doing it through the collaboratory and our data. And they said, what, what can you tell us about what you've learned? And we started talking about some of the emergency use um, authorizations like um, monoclonal antibody infusions. And we said, we think more patients could benefit from these. Our data is showing us that we're turning patients away and putting them in the hospital dead when they could go to an outpatient clinic and in two hours go home and recover. And so they said, can you study that a little bit more? And they said, can you study it if we give you some viral sequencing information. And we said, yes. And so we brought it into the platform and we essentially helped inform how they were evolving emergency use authorizations for monoclonal antibodies around the country. We've applied this to different places in our healthcare system. And now we have an annual vetting of what are the biggest problems we could do to improve the quality of patient care, access to care, and use this methodology and the data to help move the needle. Um, my career feels like it's always been about this. Right, uh, it's always about there's a new thing. Technology is always bringing like a new way we could do things. Right, it's always a better way, and but people are really busy, and maybe their minds are closed, or they're, they're just truly busy, right? Uh, but I really think that when we think about this, and this is why I sometimes use the term data is the strategy, is that we need to think about that we're transforming the model. You know what I know from my time in industry and working with great professors of our different schools of business in the University of California is that the most impactful innovation style is business model innovation. And so thinking about how do we really rethink the model. And so, so while you know, person in the middle there is trying to sell them a wheel, let's go from something square to something round. You've got someone in the background, and I think this is some of the unique points of time that we have. It's like, you know, hey, someone's got to be thinking about the robot drone you know, ants who are gonna carry those rocks over to the place where we're building the Great Wall and that they're gonna be controlled by an iPad. We need to really rethink the model and not think about just process innovation, which makes us a little bit better, but really how do we transform the model? And so we had an opportunity uh, as we were kind of thinking about the collaboratory becomes the institute that the NIH call uh, for Aim Ahead came out, which was their effort to basically say, look, we see all this stuff happening with data and AI. We have this tremendous challenge in our society, in our country around health inequity. How are these two things going to intersect? And so what we came at them with was really this concept of data, ecosystem, on ramps, finding innovations and pushing it back out to the edges. That it's not just the academic medical centers that sit in our urban centers that should benefit the patients with better care. We have to reach every corner of the United States and $340 million. And so we put together the right set of partners, partners who were there, who support those people at the rural clinic in Montana, at the critical access hospital in Mississippi, people who were at that point of care and said, we're gonna get their data, build trusted relationships with them to get data into the system. And we're gonna push the tools that we develop, you know, given the great capabilities of research universities like UC Davis, and the partners of APHIS, and we're going to push it back out. That's the only way to really transform equity of healthcare in the United States. Sometimes it's a bridge too far. We made it pretty far in the conversation, but I think we maybe were just a little too far out in front of where they were comfortable with. So we didn't get the award. It's okay, because we didn't stop. 
we have started to build our own public private ecosystem because we have enough people who really understand the vision that we're talking about here, the transformative way. And so we're now really building our own ecosystem amongst right now the coalition of the wilding. You know, federal organizations are involved as well as academic medical centers and community partners across the country using this concept that we've built around the collaboratory and taking advantage that it's a boundaryless system. It has nothing to do with UCI other than UCI as a partner. It's about really the ability to utilize a platform to bring together data, uh, to be able to drive it at an impact of impacting the way that we think about policy for the United States, creating more equitable solutions that actually close the equity gaps in healthcare across the US and actually how do we take care of patients tomorrow? And maybe that's in the hospital and maybe that's in the clinic and maybe that's in their home. And that's why we call it practice redesign because it's the practice of medicine is gonna be rethought with the help of data and advanced analytical techniques uh, like AI. And so a lot of what we try to get people to think about is this concept of ecosystem. It's been really successful in other industries. A lot of the industries that let's say research universities folks on, we, we, we've thought about partnerships in terms of how we've gone building uh, around, you know, buildings, these different multi-organizational institutes, but really thinking about an ecosystem about partners need to come from anywhere. How do we build bridges for those partners to come in quickly to bring the capabilities that they have? That capability could be a data set. Capability could be a, a perspective of the end user that is underrepresented in most of the other things. Let's think of clinical trials. Clinical trials is a huge issue that most clinical trials happen with a very, very, you know, strong bias towards certain types of uh, ethnic and, and, and socioeconomic backgrounds in the U.S. And we continue to struggle. And this is part of what uh, Aim Ahead is trying to get at: is how do we recruit people from other communities into the clinical trials process? And how do we think about using real world evidence approaches, working with them to actually affect how, what is available to them in terms of their treatments going forward? Uh, I think that the federal agencies and, uh, are really pushing us on thinking about this as well. As, as we looked at the new call from NSF around innovation engines, we saw some you know, dramatic differences. We saw more language in there that sounds like what we talk about from an ecosystems perspective. We talked about, they talk about not being PI led, but really hiring kind of like a CEO type person, someone to build a different type of bridge that maybe we've traditionally thought about. Um, right, galvanizing use inspired research, right, and workforce development, right, a lot of what we're reading in the innovation engines is about economic prosperity across the country, and not just giving those who have more, but bringing those who have less up. And as we speak right now, if I wasn't giving this presentation, I'd be listening to a presentation, the academies of medical sciences really putting on the table, has traditional academic medicine had its day? putting to task the question of academic medicine that has driven the way that we've thought about improving healthcare and doing translation from basic and health sciences to the bedside or to, or to the, 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 uh, the, the, clin the clinical room. Are we, do we, is it time to put it on the table and saying, do we need a better model? So this is not just an isolated thing. I think that no matter how good you do things today, you have to think in Grit, Grit, Wayne Gretzky's words, where's the puck going? And I think we have good signs that certainly in healthcare, but I would, I would venture to say pretty much any industry that we have to figure out where the puck's going next and get ourselves out in front of that. And I think that's a great question for the leaders and the advisory board of APHIS to really think about where do we need to be going next? Okay, so a few final thoughts and then we'll open up some questions, right? Um, part of the thing that I get to do in, in my role at the university, and my role is kind of very unique, you won't find roles like uh, mine at, at research universities that allows me to span from the way our student experience happens to the way we do research, to the way that we take care of patients and all things in between. But it's really about what does it mean to be a 21st century research university today? And a big part of that is not being in isolation, really being a central gravitation convener of ecosystems. How do we think about data as the strategy, not just an asset that we have with, within our control? And how do we think in a more boundaryless way? Because data in and of itself is not valuable. Contextualized data put in the hands of subject matter experts who are given the opportunity to work together and look through multiple perspectives at complex problems, help us not only generate new knowledge, but gain new insights for ways we can do things better tomorrow. Our tagline, the 101st patient should benefit from the 100 patients that we've seen with that disease before him or her. And then really when you talk about what we could get to through AI, it's how do you turn it into wisdom? 
Wisdom really being that the decisions that we make, we learn from. That we're consistently using that experience. Think about what we use in the context of our lives. As we age, we gain more experiences. It hopefully leads, hopefully leads to a better decision that I might make later today in terms of what I have for lunch, but maybe not. Uh, but how do we really use data to really build models, right? Mechanisms to bring that to life in all aspects of what we do. Uh, the, the collaboratory concept is not just something we're doing in healthcare. Uh, the concept really has legs under a lot of things. So we've now built one under our student success initiative, focused on not just graduating on time, but really gr closing graduation gaps to really leading to a world where we're really looking at personalized learning journeys for every student by understanding them through, through data and the fact that we're interacting with them in more and more ways where we can capture that data and actually use it to tailor what we help them accomplish when they're at a, at a university around the goals that they set for themselves and have them drive that, that goal development and that goal attainment. Uh, we're now looking at it in the climate and sustainability pace. Uh, a lot of data, very complex data we're trying to bring together. I thought healthcare was complicated. Then I got involved with the, the climate and sustainability people. Yeah, it is far more complex, I'm learning. So uh, we're really looking at this concept across multiple, multiple domains. And I think, again, it's about a way of thinking about the problem. Um, I'll stop it here. Um, this, I always love this curve. I, I use it as part of kind of personal management. I think we're always at that point. Uh, I think we're always at this point where you know we're thinking about where things need to go. A decision we make today is not the end of the journey, but really the start of the 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 trajectory that we're on. And I think today and what we're go what's going on, and and I think what APHIS represents and what APHIS is accomplishing and what they strive to accomplish going forward is about bending that curve in the positive direction. However, they've set their goals. So with that, I'll uh, I'll end the presentation portion and turn it over to questions. And just thank you. So if anyone has any questions, um, this microphone is not to amplify the voices in here, but so that those online can hear. So um, just raise your hand and um, Jim will come by with the, the microphone. Please ask questions. And if you're online, um, type into the chat and I will ask for Jim, is there something? Anybody? Mr. Donovan? Thanks for a really interesting talk. As, um, it, so if data is the strategy, uh, you certainly mentioned the strategic role of AI, perhaps as the method, right? I wonder from these projects, uh, from your point of view, what do you see as the critical limitations of AI and data science right now that should be overcome and how you would go about doing that? Yeah, I, th I think, um, you know, one of my colleagues said in a conversation last week, it's like, you know, the, the barrier keeps changing on us, right? We get to a better place of one and, and then, then it's a different barrier uh, that we hit going forward. Right now, I, I think it's um, in curating, contextualizing the data to make it more useful, I think is, is the biggest challenge that I see us come up against, uh, that we, we have the data, we can get to the data, we have, we've convinced uh, the regulatory, legal and privacy people that we can handle the data in a way that is privacy protecting and, 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 and it's, uh, meets all of the specifications and meets the, uh, the, the, um, the court of uh, public, uh, public perception. Uh, but I think now it's the usability of data by curating and contextualizing it I think is the biggest challenge. The, you know, um, way back when, when I was a university student, you know, I studied in the field where we, I was taught, you know, kind of the AI statistical methods, you know, that we now use. And at the time it was not, a, you know, we didn't have the data. Now we've got the data. I think as we learn how to get the data more contextualized, I think what we're going to see is that more of these techniques are going to be used. So, so right now, I think the biggest barrier I see is more in the curation and contextualization currently, not, not the AI methods that we can use. Tom, I have a question. I'm Jim Pantaleo. I'm a um, business development uh, coordinator here at APHIS, so I'm engaged with industry. I'm also a product of the Irvine School District, and I'm a brother and a husband to an anteater, so welcome. Thank you. The question is, is that we're all kind of focused on food. When we talk about food, and for example, in the UCI health system, tell us a little bit about the data collection there and how you're trying to affect outcomes for healthier patients. Yeah. So this is one of the, this is a different presentation I give, right? So one of the things that brought Ilias and I together and, and, and some members of the advisory board is we see, you know, if I'm the data is the strategy person, right? What I believe is that that continuum continues to expand and we see the, the continuum of 
agriculture, food, nutrition connect to health. Right? And the, one of the big conversations in health right now and why you see in our strategy at UCI, the individual empowerment side is, I don't know if I've met anybody on this planet yet who said on my goal list is to be a patient, <laughs> right? right? We all really wanna be just a health consumer, right? However, through a set of choices, you know, maybe uneducated choices, we've become a patient, right? So we need to retrain our society to be able to help them make decisions and do have data help them in making those decisions and point them in the right direction to keep people from being patients and just keep them in the category of health consumer. Uh, what I see is that our worlds are connecting. Why I say close, so close to what Ilias and Aphis are doing is the continuum of nutrition and health. As we say, our goal is to keep you from being a patient in the first place. Our goal is to use the data that we collect on you and that you collect on yourself, put it together and actually help you make better lifestyle choices. That our, our, our world's gonna connect through the data and the methods of how we solve problems are gonna be collaborations that we're gonna sit down and discuss, right? That's the only way we're gonna bend the curve on a $4.1 trillion spend that we have in this country on, on healthcare that six out of 10 adults have at least one chronic disease, right? The only way to get at that is to really, you know, essentially understand it better and bring it back to the individual. And what's one of the major inputs, right? If you go back to inputs, transfer function outputs, what's one of the major inputs? Food, right? So our worlds are gonna connect. It's just a matter of time before we, we uh, see someone with the wisdom will fund it for us. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's going to be fun when we get there because I've learned a lot listening to uh, the APHIS team about understanding the data that they work with. It's very different from the data that we work with, but we're gonna have to learn how to work together going forward. Tom, thanks for a great presentation. Um, so the, one of the things I've, I've, you know, sitting here trying to constantly draw parallels to the food and ag space as you're talking. And, and one of the things I, I see as a benefit you had when you started to work with, uh, to create the collaboratory was the benefit of having a massive trove of patient record and health data that you could enrich with all in all sorts of amazing ways. Right. Um, I feel like in the food and ag space, we don't have that, those natural sources and troves of data at least that we can get at um, necessarily. And that in a lot of cases, we're, and we, some things we've been talking about over the last day is we're creating a lot of those data sets or we're integrating them or we're finding stuff. Um, can you speak to you know, areas where in the collaboratory where you didn't have good data um, and you had to find creative ways to generate or integrate those data sets? And I'm particularly interested in climate sustainability because I think there's a lot of similar data that's probably going to be utilized in the space we're in. Yeah. But just talk about areas where you had to figure out ways to, to generate, integrate data sets where you didn't have it already, because that's a lot of what I think we're going to be doing here. Yeah, I mean... I might argue, I'm not an expert in the expert in space. I might argue that, that you actually have data, but you may have not have thought about it as data, you know, or it may be a low fidelity data source. But as we've seen in wearable technology, uh, right? If I look at, you know, this does not replace, you know, what happens in the doctor's office, right? This is a low, you know, it's a low fidelity data point, but it's continuous, right? And so what, one of the things that we're working on is how do you take low fidelity data and high fidelity data and, and recalibrate the data that you have to make it higher, you know, what comes from here, a higher fidelity for predictive use. So, so I, I, I would argue to go back and look at, you know, is the data actually out there? Has, has it been captured in some type of digital source, even if it's low value and can you do something with it? It would be one question I would push back at. I, th I think when I think about healthcare in terms of data that we don't have, I, I think it ultimately came down to, we didn't think about the fact that, you know, some piece of technology was actually de generating a digital signal, right? Uh, and this is happening in the med device industry now, uh, where uh, you think about, you know, everything that they're generating is, is, is a digital signal, but they've never thought about capturing it and actually trying to do something useful with it. So they're now working with us, those that have bought their equipment and saying, you know, how could I think about this data and where would you be using it if we presented it to you, right? Um, a really, really interesting concept I saw in our world, which is, you know, okay, now we've got the data and we're trying to figure out how to, from a traditional IT perspective, integrate the data into the other data sets. And someone came, came in and said, yeah, we solved that problem. I'm like, well, what did you do? We have all sorts of problems with this. It's like, oh, we put a camera and we're using computer vision and we're actually reading in real time what the screen says for the heart rate. 
And we're just taking that value because we can see it says 86, 84, 82, and we're dropping it in. And I'm like, holy crap, what an innovative way of thinking about that there's actually a way to capture the data set, right? So I, I think it's really, this is why I use it for, you know, it's a little hyperbole, but data is strategy, because I think if we think about that, something is capturing it digitally, right? I mean, you know, if, if, you know, if there's some type of meter on the water pump, you have a digital signal, right? If the drone flies over, you, you have a digital signal. Is it only computer vision or is there other data on there? Do you have sounds, right? I mean, so start thinking more broadly about where is a digital capture? And then, uh, it, then you have something to work with, then can you integrate it with other things and, and start to mine it for insights? Tom, what about privacy issues? Has that been a minefield for you during this journey? Every day. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, it, it is. And, you know, I think there's, there's the law of privacy and then there's you know, the court of public opinion, right? And, uh, and especially in healthcare, one of the things we deal with is um, underrepresented communities, their trust level is very, very different than, for example, mine, when it comes to trust of the health system and that, you know, people are uh, trying to benefit me by how they're using my data. And th there's plenty of history that, that shows that that's not always been the case. Are you covered, so you're going to open by HIPAA as a bank that's uh, sort of protector of what you're trying to achieve? Uh, yeah, at one, at one level, yes. And then also some of the privacy laws that are coming out, uh, you know, are also adding, you know, complexity to that, right? But I think about it as like an optimization routine, right? Uh, education's, education has to be a huge part of it. Um, involving the individuals, you know, that's why the empowerment part is a huge part of it is if you ask people, you know, if they would contribute their data into helping solve cancer, most people say yes. It's even higher if you are a cancer sufferer or a cancer survivor, right? So people want to do the right thing, uh, but sometimes we have to go a little bit, uh, a little bit further. Uh, one of the things that we're working on right now is rethinking the whole concept of what, what does it mean to consent to use someone's data and to make that a much more um, uh, proactive and, and participative process than it has been in the past, which has led to some of the gaps of, wait a minute, what are you doing with this data? Wait a minute, who did you share this data with? So we're really rethinking that model with the help of a major technology company. And it won't solve all the ills and it won't solve every person's concern, but you know, it's, it's little steps that over time make big journeys. Yes. Okay, going again. Um, so you and I were exchanging some thoughts prior to the talk, thank you, about, uh, about uh, coalitions of the willing and leadership. And as I'm seeing the way you think about ecosystems, um, I'm wondering what you've learned about, you know, you can have all the right ingredients to describe an ecosystem, but how do you create the collaborative effect in an ecosystem that's needed to actually make progress? Yeah. So could you share with us, you know, how you think about organizational leadership in such complex environments? Because this institute's an ecosystem, our program's an ecosystem, every one of our grand challenges is going to require that kind of leadership. And I wonder, how do you succeed in that? Yeah, no, it is, it is a real challenge. And I, I, I won't profess that I think we've got it perfect, right? I, I try to study other industries. You know, one of the things I, I've always felt that, you know, with my experiences is I try to draw upon things that I've seen uh, in other positions I've had, other industries I've been able to interact with, other models I've seen around the world, right? So we have a certain way that we fund research in the United States is different from Korea, it's different from China, it's different from Europe. So I, I think around ecosystems is, um, one is, is this concept of, boundaryless, really, really getting people to think broadly about who could, who could be an actor, right? In an ecosystem concept, you are both a participant, you know, trying to add value as well as extract value from the system, right? So thinking about that anyone who's involved could be both, you know, you know a part of the demand side or, or part of the supply side. Um, and setting up an environment and a set of rules around engagement such that, um, you know, people are able to participate and get what they want and, and, and there's a fair and equitable way to do it. Um, you know, uh, I think my, the, probably the fundamental tenant that I think about for ecosystems is it's kind of a corny uh, analogy is, it, you know, um, if you ever ask Pete Rose, it's like, you know, you had more hits in baseball than anyone else in history. What do you attribute that to? His answer is, well, I had more at bats. I just took more swings. Right. And so part of what I think about the ecosystem is continue to expand, continue to find new, you know, new avenues to bring new actors in, because what's going to create more success is more participants. And that's when if you, if you go study the ecosystems created by Apple 
right? Or the ecosystems created by Google. It, it's about massive scale, right? And I think we don't always think, we think about coalition of will and we think about finding four or five partners to work with of, you know, that we can get people aligned on versus building an ecosystem that people can plug in and get what they want out of it. And while I'm there and saying, well, wow, it's not really, we see this, I, I didn't come here for this purpose, but I found, you know, a co-conspirator for my next idea. And then we go off and do something and the ecosystem creates that. And if you can do that at a hundred X scale versus how things work today, think about the, the, the rate of progress that would come from something like that. Right. Uh, the governance model, I think, is really an interesting model to, you know, in, in our environment to study differently than, let's say, the way Apple sets up, you know, their, their platforms or how a technology company does it. Um, but I think that's kind of the, the way I think about it. And I have a question from the chat here. Um, so first of all, thank you for this inspiring talk. How do you get started connecting data sets that are topically related, but not originally designed to link up? Does it require educating external partners who assist with data engineering to understand the data sets as intimately as the data analysts? Yes, yes. I think a core competency that if you're really gonna be in this kind of data-driven whatever, is you gotta become really good at data engineering. You know, you have to really kind of understand how do you get the data, how to, how to, how to start, bringing the data, data together um, and make it more and more useful. You know, I use, sometimes I use the word curate, sometimes the word contextualize. Um, but I think you gotta be really, really good at data engineering. You know, um, you know, we've worked with some companies where, you know, they were outsourcing it. Do you bring it inside? And, you know, I'm of the philosophy of if it's core to success of what you're trying to accomplish as an organization, you need to have it under the umbrella of your control so you can um, you know, you can control the quality of what it does, the scale of what extent you need to do it. So I think data engineering is one of those uh, things that organizations that you talk to that are really seriously uh, in on the data-driven everything, they, they double down on. Um, so yeah, that was a great talk and um, definitely thank you for this. So this is kind of a tale of two cities situation where on the one hand, of course, you should be here and we should be having this great session, you know, interacting. On the other hand, you know, Davis is a, as a campus of the UC, it's, it has an, a, a food and agriculture, heavy on the agriculture culture. <laughs> Irvine does not. Um, and so, you know, there's a, when you peel back the layers a little bit for this ecosystem piece you're missing, I was just sitting here thinking to myself, I wonder what would happen if you invited this meeting in its entirety down to Irvine and put it in your, you know, Irvine Collaboratory Center or whatever, and just, I'd love to hear your view on what do you think would happen actually during those two days if that meeting was held there, number one. And then number two is, is you know, from, from the exposure you've had, you know, to, to APHIS and whatnot, um, I, could you see immediately a project that we should be doing together, actually, between APHIS and UCI's collaboratory? Yeah, so, uh, so on the first one, um, I would love that. Um, I, I think it would go as it would typically go, which is some people would sit there and eat it up and some people would scoff at it. Uh, but what Irvine has is someone, you know, created a role like mine to stir that pot. Right is my job is to get the to to ask the questions and pull people into the room and make them slightly uncomfortable. You know, for those who think that the status quo is good enough, right? I mean, you know, we're having conversations about you know, um, does our reputation equal our excellence as an institution, right? Um, you know, that's partially because I've been pushing the conversation that you know, are we you know are we really as good as we think we are? You know, my experience in business is most people are in love with their own strategy. Uh, and don't have the ability to actually benchmark themselves against really where they sit in the industry amongst their competitors. Um, so I'm always, be, I'm always the one kind of pushing that into the conversation, usually when people don't want it. So I would love for something like that because I think it would get us to see a different model from kind of how we're doing and see things that, I mean, I, I, I look at what APHIS is doing just from the presentations that have provided and the conversations and looking at the research, you know, that's out in the hallway. And I'm like, oh, we need to be doing that boy, I wish we were doing a better job at that. You know, um, hey, I'd love to connect, you know, and get people talking about the educational component because we are thinking about it differently than they are right now. 
and we can let, we could probably better inform ourselves. So I, so I think those types of things are really, really helpful to understand both peripheral what's going on, but also to challenge your underlying assumptions around your strategy. Uh, what are the, you know, is there a project that, that, that we could and should be working on right now? I think, you know, just looking at some of the, some of the funded research uh, efforts by the institution right now is there, there was a, there's a thing around um, uh, a recommendation engine that I saw. And I'm like, I looked at that. I need to go to the board, talk to the, to the individuals working on that, because, you know, I, I, I think that recommendation engine connected to how do we help people make better decisions in an informed way driven by themselves, right, rather than other forces that drive their decisions. It, it might be the right thing to go study, for example, with our Institute for Integrative Health, right, where we care about things like that, and we're trying to get in front of the train of people becoming patients. So that is the one that I saw just looking at the portfolio right now, and I'm sure through, uh, through this conversation, people will throw three or four other ideas that I haven't seen yet. Oh, wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question specifically about data access. So at least at UC Davis, there's a main campus where we are, and there's a UC Davis house system, and we have two separate systems, really. And uh, uh, when we work with medical researchers, even they want to share data, sometimes they can't, and we have to log into their system. It's a huge hassle. I'm wondering how does UCI handle this issue? Thank you. Uh, yes, yes. It, it, you know, so my role was created in part to try to uh, bridge that gap and, and break down those walls. Uh, one of the first things I did was a free the data movement, right? Uh, because you know the, the data really isn't restricted, and you can put the data in forms where you can you can handle it. I mean, and to date, for example, we identified our our, our patient information, and we've had over 700 PIs access that data in some way, shape, or form. And during the COVID pandemic, for example, we were publishing more papers at Irvine than all the other UCs put together around COVID pandemic findings. And I attribute to nothing more than we just made the data more accessible, right? So, uh, so some of it is, is, is just having a concerted effort to free the data. Um, there's another term that I've, I've adopted since coming into the, um, the academic world. It's uh, let's ask the question, right? Uh, is it fact or is it folklore? Um, I hear a lot of times that I can't do this or I can't get access to that. And it's just because of this rule or this policy or this regulation. And I'm like, okay, let's play the factor folklore game. And I can tell you, I've got about a 75% hit rate that we're dealing with folklore with a lot of things, right? And it comes back to a more risk aversion. So sometimes it's just having a role or a mechanism in the organization to push on, is there really a barrier there or is someone just risk averse because they don't want to be accountable if something goes wrong? And I think that helps us get past that, you know, that hurdle 75% of the time. Uh, like I said, you know, if I said, and I know that, you know, Davis is a little bigger than Irvine, but if I said that, hey, 700 PIs across this campus have been looking into the patient data and actually looking to find insights or connect it to something that's going on, you know, in its you know, neurodegenerative disease institute because they combine something in the research lab with something the patient data and they found a new insight and they're publishing a paper. And now a PhD student is working on some type of predictive algorithm that we could test, do an A-B test in the clinic. We just want more of that going on, right? You know, but the first thing is free the data. And happy to, you know, we've got that challenge here at Davis, happy to come and talk to the powers that be and see if we can maybe clear that hurdle. Thanks so much for this amazing talk. Uh, so I, I really like what you said about uh, how to build an ecosystem. And uh, what you have to do is not the five partners where you, it's a start and it's actually a great start, but then you have to build something that people can plug in, right? And then with all the discussion we heard here, like how do you unlist the data, you know, to the public? And when I say public, it's basic, basically the practitioners, the people that can actually use it. But also in your in your slides, you say like, actually, what is the impact to the point of care? How can we actually bring it? So the way I see it is that you have to democratize the data in, in a way that people can have access to it with not a lot of fanfare and not like waiting for too long. And that is one, this is one end. And the other end is where actually how we'll 
deliver whatever is this application to the final point of care, to the nurse, to the doctor, to the, the home care system, yeah. right? In the middle, the glue, um, it, it may be, you know, corporations as they are now, it might be academia, but also startups, also entrepreneurship. So two things here. First, how do you, if you, mm -hmm. um, uh, deal with the democratization, this, this creating the platform for data to be accessible, that's one. And of course, from the hospitals, and if you were like a hospital director, I would ask there, how do you make that accessible to uh, do doctors and nurses? And the second, what do you do in terms of entrepreneurship? How do you guys deal with that? Yeah, yeah. So, so we use some of the other capabilities on campus, right? Uh, and I'll say that, you know, we have our, what we call our Bill Applied Innovation, right? Which is our connection to industry venture community. They have, you know, we point them into those programs for quote unquote, the entrepreneurship that goes on. We also work, cause I'm a big believer. I mean, here we are at, at, you know, at a university, we have this incredible asset that I don't think we utilize to the full extent called students. Uh, so we work with our student entrepreneur center and we're actually um, trying to excite them. So for example, one of the innovation, we don't call them hackathons cause hackathons ultimately become inclusive. And there are a lot of students that decide not to get involved in a hackathon because they think that's only for ICS and engineering students, right? But so we call them innovation challenges and we demand that the teams have at least two schools represented uh, in, when they form their teams. We're doing it around mental health. And what's been really amazing, you know, is on the topic of mental health, the students showed up in a big way. 27 teams formed, 250 students came for pitch night and we had industry partners help kind of uh, fund it. And so, so we have a twenty thousand dollar prize, you know, for the five the five finalist teams that are going to do their final pitches in December, right? So, so what what I would, you know, kind of getting back to your question is, there are other mechanisms on our campuses that we can tap into to say, you know, we can we do this part, but your core competency is is giving them the scaffolding around how to take it through, you know, a business value proposition process, how to go to the, to an MVP. We just take advantage of that. And that's part of the ecosystem, right? And so we just make sure we point, point them. And again, we try to do it for startups, but then also the student related activities. And, you know, and it's, it's fun to facilitate this, right? You know, and then I start to think about, so we're doing that within the context of UCI, how to think about it as, you know, not just UCI, but how do we do that on a multi-organizational perspective? We're not there yet, but that's like one of those bridges that we know is in front of us to, to be able to play with. Students, did you like the chant, free the data? Should we chant that? Free the data. Here goes. Steve, one more. I just want to get my exercise. Okay, I'm, I'm not a student, but I'll ask a question anyway. I, I was at one time, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> so you alluded to this, but the um, underserved community issue. Um, for a little while, I lived in an area that was, you know, underserved, uh, without naming names, the quality of medical care was pretty bad. So this is an open-ended question. I won't add anything to it, but how do you see bringing, bringing these people into the fold, you know, for improvement medical care? Will you take baby steps, you know, exactly, you know, how do you think this can happen? Yeah, it's uh, so I got involved in health equity um, after uh, one of my business assignments. I lived in China, right? And so, um, you know, China at the time had mostly a third world healthcare system with, you know, a very small percentage population had what we would call equivalent to the healthcare here. And I think it was the first time when I came back to the United States after that assignment, um, which coincided actually with me joining the university in my first role, I realized that we had third world healthcare going on in our country. I just didn't see it before in the type of roles I had, right? And I think it created a, you know, kind of just um, something within me to say, health equity is gonna be something in my portfolio. So the boards, for example, that I'm on always have an equity component. Um, you know, you know, what I've learned is um, the challenges real, look really different when you go to those communities and you go to those facilities and you talk to those medical professionals. Uh, and um, we don't do that enough. And uh, we at academic medical centers 
like to think we understand the problem, but we've got to get out there. Um, you know, one of the great things when I was asked to go build businesses around the world is I went and I spent a lot of time in those markets, understanding the markets, the people, the dynamics, because it was the only way to really get to what is the customer's real need before, you know, making a blanket statement like, well, we're just going to take what we sell in the United States if we're going to sell that in China. Because I've done that and it doesn't work, right? Uh, versus we're going to understand the problems of healthcare in China and, and, and create, you know, create, build, adapt, buy solutions that meet the need. So I, I think, you know, so for me, this is why I was so excited about what we were doing in the AIM Ahead proposal, because, you know, I truly believe that we could use data to bring better healthcare to all. Uh, and that everyone deserves the best healthcare care that, 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 that data, at least data, can provide and that what medical professionals can provide. But we've got to reach them. And the concept of how do you include them, you know, from, if I just say from the technology perspective, there's data out there. Can we get that data in? Can it be part of how we build these predictive models? Can we see differences in the populations that they see versus the populations that are seen in the San Francisco Bay Area? And how can we build algorithms that will actually help deliver better care in that community. I think what we learned as we kind of got into that world is trust also works differently in those in those communities. And so that's where the partnership is, you know, it's not just about collecting their data and throwing an algorithm back out there, but how do we really think about the clinical professionals and actually building mechanisms where we build kind of communities of practice to basically say, hey, we've been working on this for the last six months. We've built these algorithms. We're looking for five beta sites around the country that want to take this algorithm and want to put it in their clinic and want to start using it for the next three months. So then we can come back and tell the community of practice, did it actually make a difference, right? And then if you can do that, right, your own kind of beta, beta program, and you find out that they, they come back and say to their peers, this actually really worked, right? And then all of a sudden going from five beta customers to 500 sites across the country becomes possible versus push it out well, it's there. I don't know why they're not using it. You know, that, that, that just doesn't, you know, that doesn't work, right? So we have to kind of build these. That's why, for me, the platform is about building a culture. It's about culture of getting involved, working with your colleagues, testing things out. Um, that, that's what I think is going to get us there to a better place. You know, and I, I'm sure the same analogy could be drawn for APHIS around, the, you know, the, the, the communities that they're interacting with, right? There's a lot of small farmers across the country where I'm sure the same challenges are, which is the big farms can, can take a lot of this stuff. But what do you do for the small farmer, you know, that's in Iowa uh, that you say, how do they benefit from all of this progress that we're making? Okay. Thank you uh, so Thank much. you so much for, for the opportunity to step Thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing your experience and perspective. This has been really valuable. Um, thank you all for a, a great discussion um, and for your presence here today.